Hey, I'm Ryan, and welcome to Nest Hacker. So, have you just been dying to learn about processor flags, branching, and instruction fetch cycles? No? Well, stick around anyways, because I'll explain all of that and more in the third part of my 6502 assembly crash course. So far, all of the programs that we've covered in the course have performed a single set of instructions on some set of data. For instance, in the last episode, I showed a routine that would add two bytes together, then store the results into RAM. Now, the value that gets stored can change depending on what two bytes we tell the program to add, but no matter how we change the input, that program will always execute the same series of instructions. In this episode, I'm going to show you how to write programs that don't always do the same thing. These programs can use data to make decisions that allow them to run different sets of code based on some condition. This is called branching, and it's a pretty important concept in all types of computer programming. But before we dive in, I need you to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. After that, I'll explain a little bit about how game programs on the NES make decisions. Normally, when running code, the 6502 moves from instruction to instruction, one after another. And sometimes when you're programming, this is all you need, just a series of instructions to make some effect occur. Many times, though, you'll need to do something a little more advanced. Let's say you're programming a game, something where the player has a health bar, like Mega Man. During the course of the game, the player will occasionally get hit by an enemy or a projectile. And when this happens, the game will need to process the hit by taking some health away. Subtracting the damage from the health is a pretty straightforward process and can be accomplished by simply executing a series of arithmetic instructions. But once the math is done, one of two things can happen. Either the player will have health remaining and the game will continue, or they won't and it's game over. This is an example of a time when a program needs to make a decision. To do so, it looks at the answer to a yes or no question and then chooses to execute one of two potential code paths. In this instance, the question is, does the player have any health remaining? And if the answer is yes, then the game should continue by executing instructions involved with normal gameplay. But if the answer is no, then the program should jump to another part of the code and execute instructions to show the game over screen. Remember, programs are just data and instructions that operate on data. So how in the world are we supposed to get all this jumping around and decision making to work if we only have those two things? Well, it's not all that complicated, but in order to understand it, I need to introduce you to a few things, the first of which is a new processor register. The register in question is called the program counter, and it's integral to how the 6502 works. The program counter holds the 16-bit address to the next instruction for the program. On the NES, this is usually a value in system memory between addresses 8000 and FFFF. As I've mentioned in previous videos, each instruction in a fully linked 6502 program is represented by a series of bytes, with the first byte determining the name of the instruction along with the addressing mode being used. For instance, the load a immediate 10 instruction, once assembled, is encoded into the following two-byte sequence. A9 is the opcode used by the 6502 that represents an LDA instruction using an immediate addressing mode, and 0a is simply the decimal value 10 encoded into a hexadecimal byte. Other instructions are assembled into different sequences of bytes. INX uses implicit addressing, which doesn't have any address operand, so it can be encoded using only a single byte. This STA instruction, on the other hand, uses absolute addressing, which requires three bytes, one to encode the instruction and two more to encode the 16-bit address operand. When the processor is ready to execute an instruction, it first locates the data for that instruction using the address in the program counter. The first byte represents the opcode for the instruction, which it uses to determine how many more bytes it needs to load. Every time it loads a byte, the processor increases the value of the program counter by 1. So when it's done loading all of the bytes for the current instruction, the program counter will point to the first byte of the next instruction in the program. This is the mechanism by which the processor is able to step through instructions one after another. And in addition to this default behavior, certain instructions can modify the value of the program counter as a result of their execution. So this is how we skip around inside of a program. We can use these special instructions to modify the program counter, effectively telling the processor to go to another part of the code. 
That being said, this is only one piece of the puzzle when it comes to having our programs make decisions. The next piece has to do with how to determine the answers to those yes or no questions. In addition to the program counter, the 6502 has another special register called the processor status register. This is an 8-bit register that holds a series of flags that can be set or cleared as part of the execution of various instructions. Each flag is represented by a single bit inside the register, and you can think of each individual flag as being the answer to some yes or no question. If you watch part 2 of the crash course, then you've already encountered one of these flags, specifically the carry flag. As we saw in that episode, the ADC instruction sets the carry flag to 1 if the addition operation resulted in a carry after adding the final set of bits for the numbers. On the flip side, the instruction clears the carry flag, which to say sets it to 0 if the addition operation didn't result in a carry. By setting and clearing the flag this way, the ADC instruction provides the answer to a single yes or no question. Did the addition that was just performed result in a carry bit? Now, that's a pretty specific question, but it's only one of many questions that can be answered using the carry flag. Different instructions will set or clear this and other flags for all sorts of reasons. A good example of this comes from investigating a special instruction called COMPARE, or CMP. The CMP instruction is used to compare the value in the accumulator against another value somewhere in memory, and sets various status flags based on how those values relate to one another. If the value in the accumulator is less than the value in memory, then the instruction sets something called the negative flag. This makes sense if you look at it mathematically, as one way to compare two numbers is to subtract the second number from the first. So if the first number, in this case the value in the accumulator, is less than the second number, aka the value in memory, then the result of that subtraction will be less than 0, or negative. If the numbers are equal to one another, then CMP will set something called the zero flag. Again, this makes sense. If the two numbers are equal, then the result of the subtraction will be zero. Finally, if the value in the accumulator is greater than or equal to the value in memory, then the compare instruction will set the carry flag. Though I'm not sure there was any slick mathematical reason why the designers chose to use the carry flag here. Regardless, by setting or clearing these three flags, the COMPARE instruction provides us with information about how two values in the system mathematically relate to one another. So thinking back to our example of a Mega Man type game, if we can frame our question about whether or not to show the game over screen as a question about the mathematical relationship between two numbers, then we can answer this question using CMP. The only thing that's left is to somehow use the answer to either continue the game or show the game over screen. As it turns out, the 6502 has an entire suite of instructions that were designed for the express purpose of handling this type of task. They're called branch instructions, and to see how they work, let's take a look at an example. Keeping with our theme of health bars and game over screens, for this example I created a routine that uses the CMP instruction along with a branch instruction to determine whether or not the game is over based on the player's current health and some incoming damage. This routine is meant to be run after we know that the player has been hit, but prior to subtracting the damage from the player's health bar. The goal of the routine is to set a particular value in memory that makes it easy for other parts of the code to determine if the player is dead. Looking at the first section, on lines 6 through 11, we find a pretty straightforward RAM initialization routine. Specifically, this section is initializing three spots in memory. Address 00 to store the player's current health, address 01 to store the amount of incoming damage, and address 02 to store the results of the routine. The next section, on lines 14 through 16, contains the code that makes the actual branching decision. First, the amount of incoming damage is loaded from memory location 01 into the accumulator, and then a CMP instruction is used to compare that damage to the player's health at memory location 00. If the damage in the accumulator meets or exceeds the player's remaining health, then the CMP instruction will set the carry flag. Otherwise, if the damage is strictly less than the remaining health, the instruction will clear the carry flag. At this point, the carry flag contains the answer to a very particular yes or no question. Will the amount of incoming damage fully deplete the player's remaining health? If the flag contains a 1, then the answer is yes, the incoming damage is lethal. If it contains a 0, then the answer is no, the player can survive the hit. This leads us to the next instruction of the routine on line 16, BCC or branch if carry clear. This instruction uses the carry flag to determine whether or not to jump to a different location in code. 
If the carry flag is clear, then the program will branch to the instruction directly after the not underscore lethal label defined on line 23. This RTS instruction simply exits the subroutine, meaning that the value stored in the output memory will retain its initial value of 0, which indicates to the rest of the program that the player will survive the hit. Otherwise, if the flag is set, then the BCC instruction will not branch and the program will proceed as normal. This means that the code on lines 19 and 20, which load a value of 1 into the output memory, will be executed indicating that the damage from the hit is lethal and that the program should probably show a game over screen. A quick note here, there's actually a way to rewrite the routine to avoid having to use a branch instruction entirely. But because this episode's all about branching, I decided to keep it so that I could illustrate the point. If you can figure out a way to change the routine to remove the branch yet still give the correct answer in the output memory, let me know down in the comments and I'll pin the first few correct responses that I see. Branching is one of the most powerful parts of modern computer programs, and the example that I covered in this episode is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how it can be used to implement novel and interesting algorithms. For now, I just wanted to whet your appetite by showing you a bit of a limited view on the topic, but I'll be covering more complex and interesting examples in the future. Thanks for watching Ness Hacker. If you like this episode, smash the like button and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.